All right, thank you. Um, so as mentioned, uh, my name is Michael Marizzi. I'm a senior software developer and a technical lead for a district builder at Azavia. We're a, a software agency based in Philadelphia, uh, a B corporation. Uh, we try and do uh, focus a lot of our work on geospatial software uh, with a social impact. Um, I have with me Daniel McGlone, who's the product manager for a district builder. He's gonna tell you a bit about it. All right, so District Builder. Um, District Builder is web-based redistricting software. Um, redistricting, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Uh, redistricting is commonly referred to as redistribution. Um, internationally in the US, it's uh, called redistricting. Um, it's free to sign up, free to use, and it's also completely open source, and um, we'll share some links about that later. Uh, it allows users to draw congressional, um, all, all, all 435 congressional districts in the U.S., as well as state legislative. So in the U.S., every state has its own legislature with its own district drawing process. Um, and then as well, as some local electoral districts. Uh, we have set it up for cities and counties um, and other types of districts uh, as well. It contains complete uh, census data, um, and that is all of the demographic and, and racial data that goes into redistricting and must be part of the process in the US, as well as uh, block level data editing, um, block level being literally like a, a city block. Um, that is the, the level of precision that's necessary when redrawing districts. Um, and also allows you to evaluate your plan for signs of gerrymandering. This is a very uh, hot topic in the US. Uh, Gerrymandering being drawing districts with a, a bias in them uh, favoring one group or other. That could be a racial group, it could be a political group, uh, anything uh, like that. So in the US we have quite a unique process where, wherein um, all of the districts, and those are the national, state, and local level districts all across the US change every 10 years as a result of the census. So, it essentially upends the political geography and the political landscape of the entire country every 10 years. Um, and uh, districts in the US, and the reason why we have our process and the reason why um, the census is so important uh, is that we, we have these landmark Supreme Court cases that took place in the 1960s. Um, and these established some very rigid principles for redistricting and, how, and what districts should look like. Um, uh, of course, this is all left up to interpretation in, in states and, and, and other courts, so which is why we continue to have a controversial process, even though we actually have very rigid guidelines uh, for how this might, uh, they, they should take place. And those are essentially these two principles, the principles of one person, one vote, um, and equal population. So um, there has to be, the districts have to have uh, just about uh, equal population. For our Congress, the districts literally can only have a one person deviation in the districts. They need to be almost ex exactly the same population. For states and localities, there's a little bit more leeway. And we've built this all into the software so that it knows if you're drawing a congressional district, you have a certain amount of leeway in, in, in districting, um, and a little bit more so for state and local. So this really changed the entire process of redistricting when these uh, Supreme Court cases came out in the 60s. Um, in the 1970s, uh, cities, counties, states were rushing to get this done. Uh, it was mostly done with paper and pencil. Um, so there were, you know, lots of smoke-filled basements of Capitol buildings across the U.S. where people were marking up things and, and, and drawing all these districts by hand. Uh, but today, it's very precise, obviously, with all the software we're familiar with. Um, there's very precise uh, block-level data um, that can be used. And it's often supplemented um, with other types of household data. Um, so there's very, very uh, precision level of targeting for mapping, which can be used for good, can be used for bad. Um, the goal of District Builder is to make redistricting open and accessible. In the US, because of our system, it's district, districts are drawn differently in every state, in every county, in every city. Some places have more open processes, but most places don't, and a lot of people uh, think that it should be more open. So this, the goal of this product is to make it open and accessible to the public uh, in a web browser. Um, so a little bit about some of the features really quick, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about these and some of the challenges in building this. Because there's so much data and because you need the, the precise level of drawing, um, we built in tools to be able to easily select large numbers of census blocks and add them to districts. And you can see it's very responsive. You have a rectangle tool, a point and click tool, and a paintbrush tool. And as you're 
selecting all of these blocks, it's automatically updating the, the population data on the left with all of the different racial demographics necessary, the political score, uh, a compactness score, things like that. Um, and then the evaluate panel, which I talked about. So this is uh, all of the potential signs for gerrymandering. So looking at competitiveness, uh, compactness of the districts, as well as uh, a majority minority um, uh, viewer, uh, because majority minority districts are in many cases required uh, across the US. Um, so that's a little bit about the product and I'm gonna hand it over to Mike. All right. Thanks, Daniel. So uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about the uh, technical challenges that we faced in getting uh, this, and particularly supporting the block level data and drawing uh, at the, the census block or the, the city block level. Um, this was a really big challenge for the application. It was um, when we had done a, a first iteration of District Builder in the 2010 to support that redistricting cycle, we really struggled with supporting this. Um, and we knew it was something we really wanted to, to take care of uh, really well uh, for this iteration of the project. Uh, but it's just a lot of data for these, even for smaller states, when you're at the census block level, you can't zoom out to the state level and see everything. You saw in the video, we had to zoom in to interact with the census blocks. And then common tools that we're really used to using at Azavia for manipulating geospatial data, like PostGIS, Geo, Google, or extremely slow at the core operation that we need to do, which is to combine all of these various census blocks and counties and block groups together into the district map uh, for your, your state. Um, we, and then we're additionally, we're supporting all 50 states on District Builder um, and have to m manipulate, process the resources for all of those um, and in fact, even keep them loaded in memory at all times. I'll talk about this a little uh, in a further slide. Um, so we ended up having some pretty serious resource constraints on our back end because of that. And then we also ran into an issue, um, the, the operations to merge the geometries together uh, were running on the main thread on our back end. Um, and also there were CPU heavy operations on the front end. Uh, in sort of processing all of this data. And we had to refactor our application to move that to be a, a multi-threaded application so we wouldn't have these uh, issues with uh, lockups. Um, so like I, I mentioned, we knew going into the project that supporting this block level data was going to be a really big effort. We put some initial research into it. Um, we had a, a client side prototype that was using block group data but never got down to the block level. Um, so we had a rough idea of how we wanted the application to work, but we didn't quite, we hadn't gotten down to that uh, level of detail. Um, but dealing with these census blocks are just, it's frustrating. The, the largest state in the United States, Texas, the, the file size for the, the input data was one and a half gigabytes. Um, this is just like way too large to deal with on the client side, um, especially for supporting things like mobile clients. Um, and then the various tools that we had tried were just far too slow. Post-GIS, we couldn't even merge together the blocks of a single county in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, similar issues trying to use front-end libraries like turf.js. Um, uh, we had used TopoJSON in our client project, which is, uh, I'll get into a bit later, but it's a library for manipulating topology data. Um, knowing that, we also tried out the PostGIS topology suite, but we ran into some some issues with that, I think, maybe if the documentation was a little better, we could have worked through it. Uh, but, but ultimately, TopoJSON is, is what helped us work through this, and I'll go into that in a little bit more depth. Uh, but first, what, what is TopoJSON? Um, so it's a file format and a library for working with topology data, data that naturally shares boundaries. Um, and so instead of under each feature, you put the coordinates for your um, uh, like the full coordinate array for your, your polygon or your line segment or what have you. You instead just store an index of the arcs in that, and then you have a separate list of every arc for all of the features in your topology. And in this way, they can share their uh, coordinate arrays. So if they have a line segment that borders, that you have two polygons that border each other, they'll only define the line segment between them once instead of twice, once on each polygon. 
Um, so this is really good because it uh, makes each individual feature smaller. Uh, the, there's a little bit of extra text here, but uh, this is, uh, if you ignore the, the extra JSON ceremony, this is wh when you do this double JSON conversion, you often see your file sizes shrink fairly dramatically. Um, but more than just the file size shrinking, um, the other thing that was really, really <coughs> beneficial for us is that um, because all of these uh, shared coordinates are in this singular arcs array, uh, one of the other things that the TopoJSON uh, JavaScript library offers is some uh, utilities for manipulating TopoJSON. And one of those in particular is uh, the merge operation, which is, is pretty equivalent to uh, dissolve operation for like a GIS program and is much, much, much faster than uh, doing it with a traditional uh, geospatial uh, library because you have all of the uh, 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 arcs already together in one section and you're identifying them by index. It's much easier to identify which ones are duplic duplicative once you've brought all of your geometries together. Um, so this worked out really, really well. Whereas it took three seconds to do just merge just one county's worth of blocks. And when we used TopoJSON, we could do all 700,000 blocks of California in a couple of seconds. Um, so definitely got the performance level that we were looking for. Uh, we did run into a bunch of integration issues with this approach though. Um, Azavia is mostly a Python Django backend uh, for the work that we do. Um, on, on the majority of our projects, so having a really heavy node component on the back end was a bit new for us. Um, and then, like I mentioned, our input data was just really large. Uh, TopoJSON has a command line interface uh, for manipulating data, which is honestly where I was more familiar with it than using it as a, a back end library. But our data was too large for it because it's, the input files were too large to be read in node without streaming. Um, so we had to write our own custom preprocessing pipeline. Uh, and then even when we're done and we have these much smaller TopoJSON files, they're still incredibly large uh, with um, the largest of them approaching under half a gigabyte. Um, and so we couldn't just load them as necessary. We actually had to keep them loaded in memory at all times because it took too long just to load the JSON and parse it, um, which ended up giving us a bunch of resource issues where we had to have all 50 states in the United States loaded in memory at all times on our back end. Um, and then that caused us some issues when we uh, expanded the, uh, the uh, part, one of the big deadlines for the project was uh, responding to the new data from the 2020 US Census uh, because redistricting is done based on uh, the t new census data. Uh, so at the start of the project, we had 2010 data, and then we sort of scrambled and added a bunch of more states um, when the 2020 census data was released. But this caused our server to fall over and die when we tried to start it. Um, it, it turns out that this, uh, we had to increase a kernel parameter uh, because we were loading so much data at application startup that we ran out of something called memory mapped areas. I had never heard of this before, but apparently other tools that load a lot of data into memory often run into this, like uh, Elasticsearch. Um, and then I mentioned uh, like file size limitations. Um, the, we actually discovered partway through the project that uh, there is a 512 megabyte file size, uh, uh, 512 megabyte limit on the size of a string in Node.js which we discovered because we updated to node 16 and hit that limit, uh, which had been lowered from I think two gigabytes in a previous version and could no longer load our input files. <laughs> and we had to uh, do some uh, work. We looked into uh, like switching out to a custom serialization format, but we ended up uh, instead stripping some of the data that we didn't need out of the topo JSON and putting it to like a sidecar file. I'll, I'll talk about a little bit at the end if I have some time. Um, and then we were able to get back down under those file size limits. 
Um, and I mentioned at the start that we had these issues with uh, CPU blocking. Um, the topo JSON operation takes a few seconds. And then uh, Node.js, we weren't as familiar with this process because we don't use it on the back end nearly as much, but it is a single threaded uh, runtime. And so if you have a blocking CPU operation, then you can't respond to any other requests and our health checks were failing. So uh, we had to do a um, bit of a refactor on the back end of the application to use uh, threading. Uh, this was more painful than I thought it would be going into it because you can't actually share memory between threads in Node. You, they each have their own memory um, or you can share like only uh, numeric typed arrays. Um, so instead we had to move downloading our large files into the threads as well and then like come up with this complex system to, to move requests to the thread that had the right data. Um, which took some time and was very tricky to get right and especially tricky to write tests for. Um, and then lastly, I mentioned this a little bit. So we had, um, this is more on the front end than the back end, but still dealing with these massive uh, data sets with uh, block root, uh, blocks and trying to, one of the things that you saw in the demo was updating the sidebar and updating the tooltip as we use the rectangle selection tool um, and, or, or the paintbrush to show the demographics of the districts that you're drawing, the partisan breakdown of them, et cetera. Um, and so in order to minimize our, our tile size, minimize the topo JSON size, uh, and make this operation faster, we use this technique uh, to pull the numeric data out of our tiles and into uh, typed numeric uh, array buffers. And then in the, the tiles, the only thing that we have is an index of like where to go look up your thing in the, the typed array buffer, which worked out to be quite a bit faster, though even there we still had to move things to a uh, back end worker process to avoid lag in the front end. And uh, so how's it worked out? Uh, well, we have 44,000 public maps. Uh, you can go take a look at them on our, our uh, community maps page, 15,000 users, uh, at least one, I want to say more than that, in all 50 states. Uh, we've had a bunch of custom regions for, for organizations uh, that are political advocacy groups or municipalities, um, including Salt Lake City's official new uh, legislative districts, uh, I think for city council, yeah. being drawn using District Builder. Um, And District Builder's open source, so if you want to check out our GitHub, feel free. Hmm. All right. 